Welcome to the Coriolis Effect with Corey Oliver. Hi guys, I'm Corey Oliver. Thanks for watching the Coriolis Effect. Please hit the subscribe button below and we hope you like this episode. Hi guys, we wanted to announce that like many podcasters, we just started a Patreon account. Visit our page at patreon.com backslash the Coriolis Effect. We have five different levels of membership and offer early access to episodes, behind the scenes footage, bonus episodes, shout outs, and much more, including personal phone calls, questions and answer sessions, and live chats with Bob and me. That's patreon.com backslash the Coriolis effect. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Corey. How are you? I'm doing well. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. <laughs> <laughs> this is our first show after the new Well, our first, year. first show that we're taping. Recording, yes. Yes. And Ta are we taping it? Do we use tape recording. anymore? Recording. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I speak, I date myself, right? Yeah, it's because nobody else will. I have it. This is true. <laughs> um, that's not very nice to start the new year off with, though. That's right. I've cut what you just said out. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, that's not nice either. <laughs> um, what did you do over the holidays? I didn't really do much. You sat at home? Yeah, I really did. I had I saw my daughter, and we had a wonderful time, and my parents were with me, and I had, you know, I had a really nice Christmas. Good. Yeah, I really did. It was Not wonderful. A white one, though, but I, uh... Yeah, no, we just stayed home and, and hung out and ate. I ate a lot and uh, made a New Year's resolution. I'm not going to eat sugar for 40 days, so that's been going Why well on my that? third day, fourth day. Why would you day. do that during Lent? I just do it every year. I do it every, in the beginning of the year, I do a 40 day fast of something. And it and sugar for me is like, I think of sugar a lot. And the idea of fasting is to, every time you think about what you want and what you're craving, you just shoot a prayer up. And so I'm, I'm, th I'm praying all day long because I really love sugar. <laughs> so um, I heard on a, uh, on a actually it was a news show, but it was a guy making a joke. He said, uh, all of your New Year's resolutions are court ordered. <laughs> I know, right? Um, I have a gift for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a gift. By the way, your Christmas gift is arriving December 6th. All right. No, I'm serious. It was it's ordered. It's December 6th. I oh, sorry, January oh. 6th. January 6th. <laughs> I was like. <clears throat> December 6th of uh, 2022. No, I ordered it on Amazon, but with the shipping and everything, it's coming on January 6th. And it's oh, something that you definitely now need. Oh. <clears throat> You'll hmm. talk about it next show. Okay. I wonder what that could be. Stay tuned, guys. I'll put it up on the screen. Here, I didn't wrap it, but oh. it's it's actually. Throw, you really want me to yeah, throw, throw it? it? No, because I'll hit you throw in the it. nose. Throw no, it. I will not. Throw it. No. I will throw not. it. No. I'm not going to hurt you. I, I was going to hit the drop. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> the greatest music quiz. Oh, very nice. I know. Questions? I thought it might be kind of fun for you to play. That's so cool. Right? Play al oh, play alone. That's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Play up to go head to head with friends and family to find out if you've got pop knowledge. And I'm not a big pop guy, but okay. So if it's like 90s or anything past 89, read a question. Probably. Let's see what what it is. Maybe there's something in there that somebody, one of our listeners, our one listener will. Oh, well, yeah, will maybe the listener will know. What was the name of the founding father of rocks rock and roll who died in 2020? Who founded rock and roll? Oh, I need that one. Who is it? He's the guy that went woo and said Paul McCartney stole his woo. African American gentleman real, with a oh. Jerry Jerry curl on his hair all the time. Brown, James no, Brown. No, that's James Brown. No, he was the Godfather of soul. Uh, Little Richard. Little Richard. I love Little Richard. Yeah. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Oh, uh, these are good. These are my genre. Oh, that'd be kind of fun, right? I appreciate it. Yours is coming. Thank you. What's... Honey, don't forget to order Chris, uh, Corey's gift. <laughs> I'm gonna go with Arena. <laughs> so. Let's see who you go with this time. Uh oh. We're on a little three day vacation in um, Monterey. One of us is in the shower. And okay, one I'm of done. Us... No, I'm no, out. hold on. No, no, no. One of us is in the shower, has their phone in the bathroom, and the alarm goes off. So the one in the shower says, turn off the alarm. And the one outside the shower says, no, it's your alarm. You turn it off. And then it became a battle of the wills. No one was going to turn off the alarm. The alarm to the house or no, the, the alarm, alarm to the, the phone? phone. Like the oh. alarm was set on the phone, so we had to leave at a certain time. Okay. So the shower person said, turn off the alarm, and the person in the bedroom said, no, I'm not. <laughs> Corey, the alarm went off for an hour. No. We sat. No. We got dressed. It kept going off. We didn't acknowledge it. We you two are unreal. We went in the elevator with people. The alarm was Stop. going off. We walked through the lobby. The alarm was going off. <laughs> And the only way that alarm stopped, it stopped on its uh, by itself. Because it said, after an hour, I said, all right, I guess you're not getting me. We 
totally are ignored you it. Me? And you could not hear it. You and two say, <laughs> are unbelievable. <laughs> it was, I cannot it was believe it. So funny. Um, and boy, when you guys dig your heels in. Yeah, it was. Uh... Oops, hold on. That went off for an hour. Uh, hang on, let me try it again. Unreal. It's not playing. It's off. silence. It People are tuning out. Anyway, anyway. it's uh, this. It's the the iPhone alarm. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that's hilarious. Yeah, I can't believe that you let that happen. Yeah. And neither one of you turned it off. It just went off. For an hour. Okay. We All were right, well. walking through the lobby. And it was going, <laughs> and people are looking at us, and we're just acting like it's not on there. We're <laughs> in the elevator. Just, it's so amazing <laughs> to me. Like, I just, it, I don't know how, you guys are funny. You're really funny. <laughs> and well-suited, clearly. And then the other one was we were at dinner. I'm still going to go with Irina. Well, you don't know which one, the, which one Irina was. Irina in the shower, or Irina out of the bed. So who was right? The person in the shower whose phone it was, or the person who could have easily go turned it off? I mean, honestly, I don't. I never even got to that point in any relationship where we fought over an alarm thing. So I don't know. I don't even know. I would have okay, done. We, I would have said, "I'll turn it off. Well, Let me get to, that for you. Well, you I'll have, do it." You have to pick now. Which one's right? I don't know that there's a right or wrong. Okay, so if Irene was in the shower, was she right? Here, here's the thing. If somebody asked me to turn off an alarm, I would just turn it off. Yeah, but that's not the question. The question is, which one of us was right? I don't, I'm going to go with Irina. You don't know which one Irina was. I'm going with her. <laughs> I'm the ride or die. Thelma Louise. I was Louise. in the shower, and I didn't want to touch the phone with wet hands. And it was, I no, I'm not turn it off. Come on, turn it off. And then it was just, forget it. We're going to, we're going to. Yeah, no, you then two are hilarious. The second one, we were eating dinner on Christmas night at a restaurant, um, because our first restaurant we picked and had reservations for, it went up to be 112 miles away, because somebody didn't have their location services on on their phone. Somebody? So when they, yeah, well, somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, we were eating at a very nice restaurant and she met a, I had a turtleneck shirt on and a jacket and she didn't think I was as dressy as I should be. So that started a discussion about that. And I looked at her, I said, look, I said, I'm not your trophy husband. I will not go up there and dress up just so you can parade around with a good looking guy. You know, <laughs> and people looked at us and said, I'm not oh, your trophy husband. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh my then, goodness. I think she laughed for about 10 minutes and then <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're hilarious. Yeah. And for those of you listening who have not ever and will never I, said, I have dog, a mind. I'm smart. Yeah, right. <laughs> As you have a, a beautiful young wife yeah, who's yeah. stunningly I I walk in this morning and I literally I'm like she comes walking out gorgeous and just woke up in this like all white. I'm like, the road, like yeah. it's from heaven. And who looks like that in the morning? Come on. <laughs> I'm not, not even on my best youngest day did I look like that in the morning. But that's okay. God giveth and God taketh away. Oh, God giveth to some and not to others. Well, all right, what are um, we doing today? speaking of God, uh, this is, this is uh, going to be an interesting episode. Um, years ago, Hi, do you want me to talk about this in the intro or? Yeah, tell okay, us yeah. Tell about what you're going to do. Well, years ago, I well, I was um, I went to church one day and I I heard this sermon and it's uh, by a, a author um, and theologian named Jonathan Edwards and it's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God and I watched this sermon. It was must have been like 25, 30 years ago, a long time ago, and it I just it just blew my mind. And I've, it's never gotten out of my head, really. I, I've always, I think about it, it comes up every now and then, I'll, I'll refer back to it. I don't, it, it, I was really young when I, I heard it the first time, um, but I, I started um, wondering who this Jonathan Edwards was. So now that I'm cut two years later and we're doing this podcast, and literally one of the number one questions that people ask me all the time is if somebody was, or who could you interview that is not living? Uh, who, who would you want to interview? And I, I literally, it's the his name always comes yeah, up. Short interview if he's not living. But yeah. Well, I'm saying if I could interview him today, you know, he 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 gave this sermon 250 years ago. Uh, uh, the world was a lot different back then. Obviously, um, he ended up be he graduated from Yale. He was the president, um, the third president at Princeton University. He has a lot of accomplishments. I think he had 12 children. Um, I think. One of his grandchildren was the vice president of the United States. Uh, he, it's just a very interesting family, and this sermon was considered to have led the most people at one time to God. Okay. 
Um, and I just thought, you know what? Why not read the sermon today? Um, okay. It's it's an interesting read. Uh, it's quick. It's not a long, uh, you know, right, sermon. Well, why don't but we take, take a break, and we'll come back, and you'll read it. Okay. Okay. All right. This episode is sponsored by the Pillow Fight Podcast. Pillow Fight is a comedy and culture podcast hosted by writer and stand-up comedian Yamini Yambimadan. Yamini is joined by a guest or two each week, and they talk and gossip like schoolgirls at a slumber party. They play games like Would You Rather, based upon world news, and some juicy truth or dare. An alumni of comedy venues like The Second City and Stand Up New York, Yamini brings her politically charged and empowering humor to the Pillow Fight podcast with the aim of fostering more accessible conversations about culture and politics through the perspective of best friends gossiping at a slumber party. Listen to Yamini's Pillow Fight podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and wherever you listen and download podcasts. That's Pillow Fight Podcast with Yamini Nambimadan. And check out Yamini on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, FanHouse, MySpace, AOL, Six Degrees, Flickr, Tumblr, Twitch, Tinder, Bumble, Match, Our Time, OkCupid, eHarmony, Plenty of Fish, JDate, Christian Mingle, and FarmersOnly.com. Some links are in the description of this episode. This episode is sponsored by Brizo Healthy Fruit Tonic. With Manuka honey and apple cider vinegar, less than 4 grams of sugar, and under 35 calories per can, each of Brizo's four flavors not only taste great, they are an excellent source of vitamin C. Brizo boosts your immune system and is great for your post-workout recovery. Brizo, available on Amazon and at Brizo.com. Let's start the show. Okay, let's start the show. I'm actually going to be reading a sermon by Jonathan Edwards. Uh, straight through, and I'll just give you a little excerpt of who he is. Jonathan Edwards um, was an American revivalist preacher, philosopher, a congregationalist theologian. Uh, he is widely regarded as one of the America's most important and original philosophic, philosophical theologians. Uh, Edwards' theological work is broad in scope, but rooted in the uh, Puritan heritage as exemplified in the Westminster and Savoy Confessions of Faith. Um, this is a 250-year-old sermon, and I will begin. I'm just going to read it straight through. Okay. So if you have any questions, which maybe I don't know. So I can leave? Yeah, <laughs> you can if you want to. <laughs> um, I'm just, I really just felt led to read this today. Um, again, uh, it's one of the people to, I would to love it, to interview. Get to people are waiting to hear it. Yeah. So, Everybody's waiting with bated breath, as they say. Okay, well, Enfield, Connecticut, um, July 8th, 1741. Uh, Their foot shall slide in due time. In this verse is threatened the vengeance of God on the wicked, unbelieving Israelites, uh, who were God's visible people and who lived under the means of grace, but who, notwithstanding all God's power, wonderful words, excuse me, wonderful works towards them, remained void of counsel, having no understanding in them. Under all the, culti- under all the cultivations of heaven, they brought forth bitter and poisonous fruit, as in the two verses next preceding the text. The expression I have chosen for my text, their foot shall slide in due time, seems to imply the following things, relating to the punishment and destruction to which these wicked Israelites were exposed. Number one, that they were always exposed to destruction, as one that stands or walks in slippery places is always exposed to fall. This is implied in the manner of their destruction coming upon them, being represented by their foot sliding. The same is expressed, Psalm 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. Number two, it implies that they were always exposed to sudden unexpected destruction, as he that walks in slippery places is every moment liable to fall. He cannot foresee one moment whether he shall stand or fall the next. And when he does fall, he falls at once without warning, which is also expressed in Psalm eighteen nineteen. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Number three. Another thing implied is that they are liable to fall of themselves without being thrown down by the land, excuse me, by the hand of another, as he that stands or walks on slippery ground needs nothing but his own weight to throw him down. Number four. 
that the reason why they are not falling already and do not fall now is only that God's appointed time is not come. For it is said that when that due time or appointed time comes, their foot shall slide. Then they will be left to fall as they are inclined by their own weight. God will not hold them up in these slippery places any longer, but will let them go. And then at the very instant, they shall fall into destruction as he that stands on slippery declining ground on the edge of a pit, he cannot stand alone where he is let go immediately falls in falls and is lost. The observation from the words that I would now insist upon is there is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell, but the mere pleasure of God by the mere pleasure of God. I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will restrained by restrained by no obligation hindered by no manner of difficulty, any more than if nothing else but God's mere will had in the least degree, or in any respect, whosoever, any hand in the preservation of wicked men one moment. The truth of the observation may appear by the following considerations. Number one, there is no want of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. Men's hands cannot be strong when God rises up. The strongest have no power to resist him, nor can any deliver out of his hands. He is not only able to cast wicked men into hell, but he can not most easily do it. Sometimes an earthly prince meets with a great deal of difficulty to subdue a rebel who has found means to fortify himself and has made himself strong by the numbers of his followers. But it is not so with God. There is no fortress that has any defense from the power of God. Though hand join in hand, and vast multitudes of God's enemies combine and associate themselves, they are easily broken in pieces. They are great heaps of light chaff before the whirlwind, or large quantities of dry stubble before devouring flames. We find it easy to tread on and crush a worm that we see crawling on the earth, so it is easy for us to cut or singe a slender thread that anything hangs by. Thus easy it is for God, when he pleases, to cast his enemies down to hell. What are we? That we should think to stand before him, at whose rebuke the earth trembles, and before whom the rocks are thrown down. Number two, they deserve to cast to be cast into hell so that divine justice never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God's using his power at any moment to destroy them. Yea, on the contrary, justice calls aloud for an infinite punishment of their sins. Divine justice says of the th- tree that brings forth such grapes of Sodom, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Luke 7 The word of divine justice is every moment brandished over their heads and is nothing but the hand of arbitrary mercy and God's mere will that holds it back. Number three, they're already under a sentence of condemnation to hell. They do not only justly deserve to be cast down thither, but the sentence of the law of God that it external, excuse me, that eternal and and immutable rule of righteousness that God has fixed between him and mankind is gone out, out against them and stands against them so that they are bound over already to hell. John 18, he that believeth not is condemned already so that every uncovered man properly belongs to hell that is in his place. From thence here he, here is John 23. Ye are from beneath, and thither he is bound. It is the place that justice and God's word and the sentence of his unchangeable law assigned to him. Number four, they are now the objects of that very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. And the reason why they do not go down to hell at each moment is not because God is in whose power they are is not then very angry with them, as he is with many miserable creatures now tormented in hell, who are there and feel and bear the fierceness of his wrath. Yea, God is great a great deal more angry with great numbers that are now on earth. Yea, doubtless, with many 
that are now in his congregation who it may be are at ease. Then he is with many of those who are now in the flames of hell. So that is not because God is unmindful of their wickedness and does, a, does not resent it, that he does not lose his hand and cut them off. God is not altogether such as one as themselves, though they may imagine him to do so. The wrath of God burns against them. Their damnation does not slumber. The pit is prepared. The fire is made ready. The furnace is now hot, ready to receive them. The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is wet and held over them, and the pit hath opened its mouth under under them. And five, the devil stands ready to fall upon them and seize them as his own. At what moment God shall permit him? They belong to him. He has their souls in his possession and under his dom- dominion. The scripture pr- presents them as his goods. Luke 12, the devils watch them. They are ever by them and their right hand. They stand waiting for them like greedy hungry lions that they that see their prey and expect to have it, but are, for the, are, but are for the present kept back. If God should withdraw his hand by which they are restrain, restrained, they would in one moment fly upon their poor souls. The old serpent is gaping for them. Hell opens its mouth wide to receive them, and if God should permit it, they would be hastily swallowed up and lost. 6. They are in the souls of wicked men those hellish principles reigning that would present presently kindle and flame out into hell fire. If it were not for God's restraints, there is laid in the very nature of carnal men a foundation for the torments of hell. There are those corrupt principles in reigning power in them, and in full possession of them they are seeds of hell fire. These principles are active and powerful, exceeding violent in their nature, and if it were not for the restraining hand of God upon them, they would soon break out. They would flame out after the same manner as the same corruptions. The same enmity does in the hearts of damned souls, and would beget the same torment as they do in them. The souls of the wicked are in Scripture compared to the troubled sea, Isaiah 20, for the present God restrains their wickedness by his almighty power as he does the raging waves of the troubled sea, saying, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. But if God should withdraw that restraining power, it would soon carry all before it. Sin is the ruin and misery of the soul. It is destructive in its nature, and if God should leave it without restraint, there would need nothing else to make the soul perfectly miserable. The corruption of the heart of man is immoderate and boundless in his fury. And while wicked men live here, it is like fire pent up by God's restraints, whereas if it were less let loose, it would set on fire the course of nature. And as the heart is now a sink of sin, so if sin was not restrained, it would immediately turn the soul into a fiery oven or a furnace of fire and brimstone. 7. It is no security to wicked men for one moment that there are no visible means of death at hand. It is no security to a natural man that he is now in health and that he does not see which way he should now immediately go out of the world by any accident and that there is no visible anger in any respect in his circumstances. The manifold and continual experience of the world in all ages shows this is no evidence. This is a man not on the very brink of eternity, and that the next step will not be into another world. The unseen, unthought of ways and means of persons going suddenly out of the world are innumerable and inconceivable. Unconverted men walk over the pit of hell on a rotten covering and there are innumerable places in this covering so weak that they will not bear their weight, and these places are not seen. The arrows of death fly unseen at noonday. The sharpest sight cannot discern them. God has so many different unsearchable ways of taking wicked men out of the world and sending them to hell that there is nothing to make it appear that God had need to be in the expense of a miracle or go out of the ordinary course of his providence to destroy any wicked man at any moment.
all the means that there are of sinners going out of the world are so in God's hands, and so universally and absolutely subject to his power and determination that it does not depend at all the less on the mere will of God, whether sinners shall at any moment go to hell, than if means were never made of, of or at all considered excuse me, at all concerned in his case, in this case, in the case. Number eight, natural men's prudence care to preserve their own lives or care of others to preserve them. Do not secure them a moment. To this divine providence and universal experience do also bear testimony. There is this clear evidence that men's own wisdom is no security to them from death that if were otherwise we should see some difference between the wise and the politic politic men of this world and others with regard to their libelness to early and unexpected death but how is it in fact ecclesiastes 16 how doth this the wise man even as the fool number nine all wicked men's pains and contrivance which they use to escape hell while they continue to reject Christ and so remain wicked men, do not secure them from hell one moment. Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. He depends upon him for his own security. He flatters himself in what he has done, in what he is now doing, or what he intends to do. Everyone lays out matters of his own mind, how he shall avoid damnation, and flatters himself that he contrives well for himself, and that his schemes will not fail. They hear indeed that there are but few saved, and that the greater part of men that have died there heretofore are gone to hell. But each one imagines that he lays out matters better for his own escape than others have done. He does not intend to come to that place of torment. He says within himself, that he intends to take effectual care and to order matters so for himself as not to fail. But the foolish children of men miserably delude themselves in their own schemes and in confidence in their own strength and wisdom. That they trust nothing to but that they trust nothing but a shadow. The greater part of those who heretofore have lived under the name means of grace and are now dead and undoubtedly gone to hell. And it was not because they were not as wise as those who are now alive. It was not because they did not lay out matters as well for themselves to secure their own escape. If we could speak with them and inquire them one by one, whether they expected when alive and when they used to hear about hell ever to be the subjects of misery, we doubtless should hear one and another reply, no, I never intended to come here. I had laid out matters otherwise in my mind. I thought I should contrive well for myself. I thought my scheme good. I intended to take effectual care, but it came upon me unexpected. I did not look for it at that time, and in that manner it came as a thief. Death outwitted me. God's wrath was too quick for me. Oh, my cursed foolishness. I was flattering myself and pleasing myself with vain dreams of what I should do excuse me, of what I would do hereafter. And when I was saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction came upon me. 10. God has laid himself under no obligation by any promise to keep any natural men out of hell at one moment. God certainly has made no promises either of eternal life or any deliverance or preservation from eternal death. But what are contained in the, con- co- but what are contained in the covenant of grace the promises that are given in Christ, in whom all the promises are yea and amen. But surely they have no interest in the promises of the covenant of grace who are not the children of the covenant, who do not believe in any of the promises and have no interest in the mediator of the covenant. So that whatever some have imagined and pretended about promises made to natural men's earnest seeking and knocking It is plain and manifest that whatever pains a natural man takes in religion, whatever prayers he makes, that he believes in Christ, God is under no manner of obligation to keep him a moment from eternal destruction. So that, thus, it is the natural men who are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell, 
They have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. And God is dreadfully provoked. His anger is as great towards them and to the, as to those who are actually suffering the executions of the fieriness of, wrath, of his wrath in hell. And they have done nothing in the least to appease or abate that anger. Neither is God is in the least beyond, bound by any promise to hold them up one moment. The devil is waiting for them. Hell is gaping for them. The flames gather and flash about them and would fain lay hold on them and swallow them up. The fire pent in their their own hearts is struggling to break out, and they have no interest in any mediator. There are no means within reach that can be any security to them. In short, they have no refuge, nothing to take hold of. All that preserves them every moment is the mere arbitrary will and uncovenanted, unobliged forbearance of an incensed God. Application. The use of this awful subject may be for awakening unconverted persons in this congregation. This that you have heard in the case of every one of you that are out of Christ, the world of misery, that lake of burning brimstone, is extended abroad under you. There is the dreadful pit of the glowing flames of the wrath of God. There is hell's wide gaping mouth open and you have nothing to stand upon nor anything to take hold of there is nothing between you and hell but the air it is only the power and mere pleasure of god that holds you up you probably are not sensible of this you will find you are kept out of hell but do not see the hand of god in it but look at the other things as the good state of your bodily constitution your care of your own life and the means you use for your own preservation. But indeed, these things are nothing. If God should withdraw his hand, they would avail no more to keep you from falling than the thin air to hold up a person that is suspended in it. Your wickedness makes you as it were heavy as lead and to tend downwards with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let it go, let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend and plunge into the bottomless gulf and your healthy constitution and your own care and prudence and the best contrivance and all your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. Were it not for the sovereign pleasure of God, the earth would not bear you one moment, for you are a burden to it. The creation groans with you. The creature is made subject to the bondage of your corruption not willingly the sun does not willingly shine upon you to give you light to serve sin and satan the earth does not willingly yield her increase to satisfy your lusts nor is it willingly a stage for your wickedness to be acted upon the air does not willingly serve you for breath to maintain the flame of life in your vitals while you spend your life in the service of god's enemies God's creatures are good and were made for men to serve God with and do not willingly subserve to any other purpose and groan when they are abused to purposes so directly contrary to their own nature and end. And the world would not would spew you out were it not for the sovereign hand of him who hath subjected, subjected it in hope. There are the black clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your heads, full of the dreadful storm and big with thunder, and were it not for the restraining hand of God, it would immediately burst forth upon you. The sovereign pleasure of God for the present stays his rough wind, otherwise it would come with fury, and your destruction would come like a whirlwind, and you would be like the chafe of the summer threshing floor. The wrath of God is like great waters, that are damned for the present. They increase more and more and rise higher and higher till an outlet is given. And the longer the stream is stopped, the more rapid and mighty it uh, is its course. When once it is let loose, it is true that judgment against your evil works has not yet been, ex- has not been executed hitherto. The floods of God's vengeance have been withheld But your guilt in the meantime is constantly increasing, and you are every day treasuring up more wrath. The waters are constantly rising and waxing more and more mighty, and there is nothing but the mere pleasure of God that holds the waters back, that are unwilling to be stopped. 
and press hard to go forward. If God should only withdraw his hand from the floodgate, it would immediately fly open, and the fiery floods of the fierceness and wrath of God would rush forth with inconceivable fury and would come upon you with omnipotent power. And if your strength were 10,000 times greater than it is, yea, 10,000 times greater than the strength of the stoutest, sturdiest devil in hell, it would be nothing to withstand or endure it. The bow of God's wrath is bent, and the arrow made ready on the string, and justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow, and it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God that, and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. Thus all you that never passed under a great change of heart by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead in sin to a new state and before altogether unexperienced light and life are in the hands of an angry God. However, you may have reformed your life in many things and may have had religious affections and may keep up a form of religious religion in your families and closets and in the house of God it is nothing but his mere pleasure that keeps you from being his mom- this moment swallowed up in everlasting destruction however unconvinced you may now be of the truth of what you hear by and by you will be fully convinced of it those that are gone from being in like the circumstances with you see that it was so with them for destruction came suddenly upon most of them when they expected nothing of it and while they were saying peace and safety now they see that those things are on which they depended on for peace and safety were nothing but thin air and empty shadows the god that holds you over the pit of hell much as one holds a spider or some loathsome 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 insect over the fire abhors you and is dreadfully provoked his wrath towards you burns like fire he looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire he is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight you are ten thousand times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful venomous serpent in ours you have offended him infinitely more than a stubborn rebel did in his prince, and yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else, that you did not go to hell the last night, that you was suffered to awake again in this world, after you closed your eyes to sleep, and there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God provoking his pure eyes by your sinful, wicked manner of attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you do not this very moment drop into hell. O sinner, Consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit full of fire of wrath, that you are held over in the hand of God, whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread, with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it, and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder, and you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself, nothing to keep off the flames of wrath, nothing of your own, nothing you have ever done, nothing that you can do to introduce God to spare you one moment and consider here more particularly. 1. Whose wrath it is, it is the wrath of the infinite God. If it were only the wrath of man, though it were of the most potent prince, it would be comparatively little to be regarded. 
The wrath of kings is very much dreaded, especially of absolute monarchs who have the possessions and lives lives of their subjects wholly in their power to be disposed of at their will. Proverbs 2. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion, who so provoketh him to anger, sinneth against his own soul. The subject that very much enrages an arbitrary prince is liable to suffer the most extreme torments that human art can event or human power can inflict. But the greatest earthly potentates in their greatest majesty and strength, and when clothed in their greatest terrors, are but feeble, despicable worms of the dust in comparison of the great and almighty creator and king of heaven and earth. It is but little that they can do when most enraged, and when they have exerted the utmost of their fury, all the kings of the earth before God are as grasshoppers, they are nothing, and less than nothing. Both their lives and their hatred is to be despised. The wrath of the great king of kings is as much more terrible than theirs, and his majesty is greater. Luke 4, 5 And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more than that, that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Number two, it is the fierceness of his wrath that you are exposed to. We often read of the fury of God, as in Isaiah 18, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries. So Isaiah 15, for behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. And in many other places, so Revelations 15, we read of the wine press of the fierceness wrath of God Almighty. The words are exceedingly terrible. If it had only been said, the wrath of God, the words would have implied that which is indefinitely dreadful, but is the fierceness and wrath of God. The fury of God, the fierceness of Jehovah, oh, how dreadful must that be! Who can utter or conceive what such expressions carry in them? But it is also the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, as though there would be a great manifestation of His Almighty power in what the fierceness of His wrath should inflict, as though omnipotence should be as it is, excuse me, as it were, enraged and exerted as men are wont to exert their strength in the fierceness of their wrath. Oh, then, what will be the consequence? What will become of the poor worms that shall suffer it, whose hands can be strong and whose heart can endure? To what a dreadful, inexpressible, inconceivable depth of misery must the poor creature be sunk who shall be the subject of this? Consider this, you that are here present, that yet remain in an unregenerate state, that God will execute the fierceness of his anger implies that he will inflict wrath about without any pity. When God beholds the infam excuse me, when God beholds the ineffable extremity of your case and sees your torment to be so vastly disproportioned to your strength, and sees how your poor soul is crushed and sinks down, as it were, into an infinite gloom, he will have no compassion upon you. He will not forbear the executions of his wrath, or in the least lighten his hand. There shall be no moderation or mercy. Nor will God then at all stay his rough wind. He will have no regard to your welfare, nor to be at all careful, lest you should suffer too many in any other sense, than only that you shall not suffer beyond what strict justice requires. Nothing shall be withheld, because it is so hard for you to bear. Ezekiel 18. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, and though 
They cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yea, I will not hear them. Now God stands ready to pity you. This is a day of mercy. You may cry now with some encouragement of obtaining mercy. But when once the day of mercy is past, your most lamentable and dolorous cries and shrieks will be in vain. You will be wholly lost and thrown away from God. As to any regard to your welfare, God will have no other use to put you to but to suffer misery. You shall be continued in being to no other end, for you will be a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction, and there will be no other use for of this vessel but to be filled full of wrath. God will be so far from pitying you when you cry to him that it is said he will only laugh and mock. Proverbs 25-26 to How awful are these words, Isaiah 3, which are the words of the great God. I will tread them in mine anger, and will trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. It is perhaps impossible to conceive of words that carry in them greater manifestations of these three things, contempt and hatred and fierceness of indignation. If you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case or showing you the least regard of favor that instead of that, he will only tread you underfoot. And though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you, yet he will not regard that. But he will crush you under his feet without mercy. He will crush out your blood and make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on his garments so as to stain all his remnant. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in his utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you but under his feet to be trodden down in as the mire of the streets. 3. The misery you are exposed to is that which God will inflict to that end, and he might show that he and he might show what that word wrath of Jehovah is. God hath had it on his heart to show to angels and men both how excellent his love is and also how terrible his wrath is. Sometimes earthly kings have a mind to show how terrible their wrath is by the extreme punishments they would execute on those that would provoke them. Nebuchadnezzar, that mighty and haughty monarch of the Chaldean Empire, was willing to show his wrath when enraged with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and accordingly gave orders that the burning fiery furnace should be heated seven times hotter than it was before. Doubtless it was raised to the utmost degree of fierceness than human art could raise it. But the great God is also willing to show his wrath and magnify his awful majesty and mighty power in the extreme sufferings of his enemies. Romans 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and seeing that his, in his design and with he has determined even to show how terrible and unrestrained wrath the fury and fierceness of Jehovah is, but will do it to effect. There will be nothing, excuse me, there will be something unaccomplished and brought to pass that will be dreadful with a witness. When the great and angry God hath rise, risen up and executed his awful vengeance on the poor sinner, and the wretched, and the wretch is actually suffering the infinite weight and power of in, his indignation, then will God call upon the whole universe to behold that awful majesty and mighty power that is to be seen in it. Isaiah 12 4, through 14. And the people shall be in the burnings of lime and thorns cut up shall be burnt by the fire. Here ye are far off, what I have done, and ye that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised with the hypocrites. Thus it will be with you that are in unconverted state. If you continue it, the infinite might and majesty and terribleness of the omnipotent 
omnipotent God shall be magnified upon you in the ineffable strength of your torments. You shall be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and when you shall be in the state of suffering, the glorious inhabitants of heaven shall go forth and look on the awful spectacle that they may see what the wrath and fierceness of the Almighty is. And when they have seen it, they will fall down and adore that great power and majesty. Isaiah 23:24. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be abhorring unto all flesh. 4. It is everlasting wrath. It could be dreadful to suffer this fierceness and wrath of Almighty God one moment, but you must suffer it to all eternity. There will be no end to this exquisite, horrible misery. When you look forward, you shall see a long forever, a boundless duration before you, which will swallow up your thoughts and amaze your soul, and you will be absolutely despair of ever having any deliverance, any end, any mitigation, any rest at all. You will know certainly that you must wear out long ages, millions and millions of ages, in wrestling and conflicting with the almighty merciless vengeance. And then when you have done so done, when so many ages have actually been spent by you in this manner, you will know that it is but a point to what remains, so that your punishment will indeed be infinite. Oh, who can express what the state of a soul in such circumstances is? All that we can possibly say about it gives but a very feeble, faint representation of it. It is inexpressible and inconceivable, for who knows the power of God's anger? How dreadful is the state of those that are daily and hourly in the danger of this great wrath and infinite misery. But this is the dismal case of every soul in this congregation that has not been born again, however moral and strict, sober and religious they may otherwise be. Oh, that you would consider it, whether you be young or old. There is reason to think that there are many in in this congregation now hearing this discourse that will actually be the subjects of this very misery to all eternity. We know not who they are, or in what seats they sit, or what thoughts they now have. It may be they are now at ease, and hear all these things without much disturbance, and are now flattering themselves that that they are not the persons promising themselves that they shall escape. If we knew that there was one person, but one, in this whole congregation, that would be to the subject of this misery, what an awful thing would it be to think of. If we knew who it was, what an awful sight would it be to see such a person. How might all the rest of the congregation lift up a lamentable and bitter cry over him? But alas, instead of one, how many is it likely will remember this discourse in hell? And it would be a wonder if some are now present should not be in hell in a very short time, even before this year is out. And it would be no wonder of some persons that now sit in here in some seats of this meeting house in health, quiet and secure, should be there before tomorrow morning. Those of you that finally continue in a natural condition that shall be kept out of hell longest will be there in a little time. Your damnation does not slumber. It will come swiftly and in all probability very suddenly upon many of you. You have reasons to wonder that you are not in hell already. It is doubtless the case of some whom you have seen and known that never deserved hell more than you and that heretofore appeared as likely to have been now alive as you. Their case is past all hope. They are crying in extreme misery and perfect despair. 
but here you are in the land of the living and in the house of God, and have opportunity to obtain salvation, what would not those poor damned hopeless souls give for one day's opportunity such as you enjoy? And now you have an extraordinary opportunity, a day wherein Christ has thrown the door of mercy wide open and stands in calling and crying with a loud voice to poor sinners, a day wherein many were flocking to him and pressing into the kingdom of God. Many are daily coming from the east, west, north, and south, many not very lately in the same miserable condition that you are in, are now in happy state when their hearts filled with love to him who has loved them and washed them from their sins in his own blood and rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. How awful is it to be left behind at such a day to see so many others feasting while you are pining and perishing, to see so many rejoicing and singing for the joy of heart while you are well, you have come to mourn the sorrow of heart and howl for vexation of spirit. How can you rest one moment in such a condition? Are not your souls as precious as those of the people of Suffield, where they are flocking from day to day to Christ? Are there not many who have, had li- who have lived long in the world and are not to this day born again, and so are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and have done nothing ever since they have lived, but treasure up wrath against the day of wrath. O oh, sirs, your case, in a special manner, is extremely dangerous. Your guilt and hardness of heart is extremely great. Do you not see how generally per- persons of your years are passed over and left? In the presence remarkable and wonderful dispensation of God's mercy, you would need to consider yourselves and will wake thoroughly out of sleep. You cannot bear the fierceness and wrath of the infinite God and young men and young women. Will you neglect his precious season, which you now enjoy, when so many others of your age are renouncing all youthful vanities and flocking to Christ? You especially have now an extraordinary opportunity, but if you neglect it, it will soon be with you as with those persons who spent all the precious days of youth and sin, in sin, and are now come to such a dreadful pass in blindness and hardness. And you, children, who are unconverted, do not know that you are going to, down to hell to bear the dreadful wrath of, of that God who is now angry with you every day and every night. Will you be content to be with children of the devil with, when so many other children in the land are converted? and are become the holy and happy children of the King of Kings. And let every one that is yet of Christ and hanging over the pit of hell, whether they be old men and women, middle-aged or young people, or little children, now hardened to the loud calls of God's word and providence. This acceptable year of the Lord, a day of such great favor to come, excuse me, This acceptable year of the Lord, a day of such great favor to some, will doubtless be a day of remarkable vengeance to other. Men's hearts harden, and their guilt increases space at such a day as this. If they neglect their souls, and never was there so great danger of such persons being given up to hardness of heart and blindness of mind. God seems now to be hastily gathering in his elect in all parts of the land, and probably the greater part of adult persons that have ever shall be saved will be brought in now in a little time, and that it will be as it was on the great outpouring of the Spirit upon the Jews in the Apostles' day. The election will will obtain, and the rest will be blinded. If this should be the case with you, You will eternally curse this day and will curse the day that ever you was born to see such a season of the pouring out of God's spirit and will wish that you had died and gone to hell before you had seen it. Now undoubtedly it is as it was in the days of John the Baptist. The axe is in an extraordinary manner laid at the root of the trees that every tree which brings not forth good fruit, may be hewn down 
and cast into the fire. Therefore, let every one that is out of Christ now awake and fly from the wrath to come. The wrath of Almighty God is now undoubtedly hanging over a great part of the congregation. Let every one fly out of Sodom, haste and escape, for your lives look not behind you. Escape to the mountains, lest you be consumed. That was very, very good. I just think it is so amazing and interesting. And in, I am in no ever, people that know me know I am not a judgmental person. I remember this from years ago. It's literally called Sinners of, in the Hands of an Angry God. And it literally made me think. And I, there's so many questions that I have for the author. And that was my primary reason for wanting to read this is because I just, I there's so many unanswered questions, right? When you get to heaven, look him up and ask him the questions. I cannot. I pray to God I get to go to heaven. But it was one of those sermons that stuck with me. Um, and even more now that I've read it again. And I, I listened to it before when I was a kid and uh, or younger. And um, I just felt led to, to read it. I, I wish I could interview him. I would have many, many questions, as I know you would, too, because I see the face that yes, you're giving absolutely. me. <laughs> but um, I, for those of you who stayed tuned to the end, thank you so much for listening. Both, um, of, both of you. It, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> and um, and I don't know. It's it's just an interesting. If anybody has any comments or, or even questions, I would love to know what their questions are, because I have a lot regarding this. And, you know, there's it's. A lot of it was based on scripture. I would wonder, you know, what inspired him to write this. He's written several books. And as I said, he was um, highly favored back in the day and, and uh, uh, president of, of Princeton University and graduate of Yale. And, and I just, it just was a very interesting sermon um, yeah. and led the most people at one moment to God. So well, if you have any questions or comments, email us at yes. CoriolisEffect at gmail.com. Yes. Uh, it's either Coriolis Effect or the Coriolis Effect at gmail.com. I'll really find Bob? it out. I'll, I'm going to overdub this and put it in the right one. Please, <laughs> the, please email us at Coriolis Effect at gmail.com. Um, yes. Yeah, let us know. And you can comment in the YouTube. Yes. Okay. That was a great show. Thank you. And we're out. The Coriolis Effect is produced by JS Productions. Producers Corey Oliver and Bob Victor. Host Corey Oliver. And editors Bob Victor and Cade Bonsall. Hey guys, I'm Corey Oliver. And thank you for watching The Coriolis Effect. We hope you enjoyed the previous episode. Here are some more episodes you might enjoy. Hit the subscribe button below and have a great day.